on. If you are here for the thread study, you can start picking up your packets. And just a word, tonight is the best night. I'm so excited. I have been gearing towards this night and the thread study for the entire time. All right, so you made it on the best night. Grab your, uh, grab your packet of information and buckle your seatbelt. You got our stools? All right, all right, how are we doing? All right, keep, keep grabbing, get settled. We got a lot to cover, in case you can't tell, I'm pretty jacked, I'm pretty wired about this one, so get ready, get ready. Tell your friends about this one, it's recorded, okay? So we're going we're gonna to post it online. All right. Uh, hopefully you, you've grabbed your sheets and you're ready to go. You're going to need your sheets. Uh, as, if, as with a lot of things, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you to keep your eyes up here, but there will be uh, a number of times where Daniel or myself, we're going we're gonna to point you directly to the sheets. So uh, you, you have those and, and be ready to flip through them. So Let's pray, and then we'll jump into it. Do, do we have any housekeeping, any questions before we get started? We good? All right, let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for this evening. We thank you for your word. 
Oh my goodness, it is magnificent, God, your hand and your authorship throughout thousands of years, God, preparing the coming of your son and all that it has entailed. God, you are so full of, of magnificent, beautiful drama and articulation of the coming of uh, your son. God, may we see that in magnificent form this evening. We love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Okay. Um, as with uh, as with almost every thread, it, you should know at this point, right? It, it begins in Genesis. It begins in um, where we're going to start tonight in Genesis three fifteen, um, and that is that at the very beginning, when at the fall, and then the curse begins to unfold. Right? There's a seed. Uh, of the woman that is given promises, and but then the seed of the enemy, the serpent. Okay, and this there's going to be enmity between those two seeds. Okay, the seed of the woman and the seed of the serpent. Now we're going to pick up on this in a in a moment. Yes, sir. Enmity. There's going to be war. There's going to be fighting between strife, strife between those two. Thank you. Okay, Um, and so uh, Daniel's going to pick up on this in a moment and detail it a little more, uh, but coming out of the first three chapters of Genesis, you should have this expectation that they're, watch the the warring, okay? Uh, The first thing that happens immediately after this, right, is uh, is, uh, Cain kills Abel. And as you watch that, you're supposed to realize that that Abel is the seed of promise, but Cain is the seed of, and they're they're warring. Okay. Now, why this matters is because we're gonna we're gonna follow this line of the righteous sufferer. This is our thread tonight. Now, the easiest way to understand this is that the ultimate righteous sufferer in the Old Testament is King David. Okay, and uh, we're. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show you two major patterns, not only that happen with David, but patterns that happen elsewhere, okay? And, and then we're going to come back, and I'm going to show you, once you understand those patterns with David, you're going to see that the Psalms explode, explode with prophecy and pattern and anticipation of the coming righteous sufferer, okay? So that's where we're going. Now, David, particularly when he writes the Psalms, he's going to have two areas where David has long suffered, okay? The first one that we're going to look at is that David suffers under the evil king Saul, okay? You remember this thread and movement? You you have this basically written out, but right, you, you remember Saul is the king, David rose up defeating Goliath. He's a type there, by the way. David defeats Goliath, okay? And then, uh, but Saul is still king. Saul is the anointed one. Um, And David is going to long suffer as Saul is going to hunt and pursue him. I always have to look this up every time because I forget how long uh, David had to run from Saul, but it's like, Seven or 13 years. Those two numbers stick in my mind. I know Joseph was in the pit for 13 years, but Saul has to run, uh, David has to run from Saul for like at least seven years of his life, okay? He's running in the wilderness and he's hiding. And many of the Psalms are written during that time. David has done nothing wrong. King Saul, the spirit of God has left Saul and David hates and pursues and does everything he can to kill David, who he knows has been chosen by God. He's been anointed by Samuel. And, and Saul knows, I hate that guy because he's he is God's favored one. And David is completely righteous, okay? So that's, that's this thread. Now, with that thread, there are Others that fall underneath this same pattern, not just David. We've looked extensively at the Exodus, right? Under Pharaoh as the, okay? Pharaoh as the evil overlord. I spelled that wrong. Guys, I'm a terrible speller. Okay, 
Pharaoh as the evil overlord and the Exodus account, right? We did a whole thread on the Exodus, but God's people are righteous and Moses is righteous and they sit underneath Pharaoh as the evil overlord. Do you see that pattern? We, we won't go into it. It's written out extensively or, or just briefly here on your sheet, okay? But there's another pattern. And so Daniel's going to take us through real quickly how Job is also a righteous sufferer who suffers underneath an evil overlord. Go ahead. Yeah, so we, I mean, we, we think immediately of, of Job when we think of someone suffering, correct? I mean, that would be one of the first places we go if we, if we know our Bibles. We would think of Job. And if we're thinking of Job suffering under an evil overlord, who is the evil overlord in the story of Job that we're introduced to right in the very first chapter? It's Satan, right? It says Satan approaches God and says, have you considered Job? Right? And so we see from that point forward the, the, the suffering the, that, is, that is brought up on Job. We see it's directly tied to what Satan does to, to test Job. Um, but Job is more than just this picture of, of, of someone who is just suffering unbelievable loss and tragedy and those uh, even physical um, you know, infirmities. I mean, he, it's much more than that. I want, I, we gave you a chart because I want you to see how the suffering of Job mirrors in, in many ways Christ. So look at this here. Job, uh, Job 1 tells us that he was righteous. Um, now we would say he was, he's relatively righteous, right? He's, he's not absolutely righteous because if you look on the other side of the chart, who is the only one who is absolutely righteous? Jesus, but, but we're, we're told to look at Job as though he is a righteous man, right? We see that Jesus is, is righteous. We see that Job suffers, right? I've given you some passages there where we really see the suffering of Job be brought out, right? He loses his children. He loses all of his, his wealth and his, and his livestock and, and all of his belongings. It's gone. He loses his health, right? So many things there. And then he ends up with three friends there who he probably would have liked to have been rid of, but, but he's stuck with them through, through the entire book, right? So Job suffers greatly, but then our minds should be drawn to, to the suffering of Christ. Think about the passion of, of our Savior and the suffering that he endured, right? We're, we're told to look at the fact. Now, did Job, did he do anything from what we see in, in the narrative to, to deserve the suffering, right? Is the suffering a result of his uh, choices, his, his actions, his decisions? No, right? We would say that he, he was innocent but suffered. We would say the same thing. Christ was innocent but suffered. We would say that Job's battle, right, that he was fighting was, was a spiritual battle, right? It was, it was Satan testing Job. Right now, I think it's interesting as we think about it, Job didn't always face this testing and this, this, um, this spiritual battle uh, with the most upbeat attitude, did he? There were, you know, he, he was ready to be done with it, right? He did not want to go through this. But when we think of Christ, right, fighting this battle, we think he did it willingly, right? In the Garden of Gethsemane, when he set his mind and he set his, his, his sights, his eyes on the cross, right? He said, nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. He went willingly to the cross uh, to suffer as he fought the ultimate spiritual battle, right, for, for us. We see Joseph at the, or Job at the end of the story, he is, he's restored, correct? He's, he's humbled, at the very beginning, right? Here's a man with great wealth and, and power and all of these things who is humbled, right? But then at the end, he's exalted, right? He, gets, he, he has more children. He, he, he's able, his wealth, he has more livestock. God blesses him more in his latter years than in his former years, uh, Job tells, the, the story tells us. Think about Christ, right? We, we see Christ leaving, leaving heaven, right? humbling himself, scripture tells us, taking on, right, the, the taking on flesh and coming, humbling himself so that he can ultimately go to the cross for us. And then scripture tells us, but then God highly exalted him, right? So we see, we see the connection there. And then another one that's very interesting, Job acts through it toward the end of the, of the account as an intercessor for his friends, God actually tells his friend, bring a sacrifice and offer a sacrifice and ask Job to pray for you, 
right? And then we see Christ, right? If we, if we were to go to Romans 8 or, or Hebrews chapter 7, we would see that Christ is, is our intercessor, making intercession for us. So, so this type, this righteous sufferer that we see in the Old Testament is this beautiful picture that, that shows us, that points us to Jesus and the suffering that, that he would endure. Yeah, and if, and if we were looking at these, we would say that uh, uh, th- this uh, Pharaoh in this, the, the Exodus account right here is, is the primary uh, one here and, and that we, we can certainly see and walk through how, how Job pictures and parallels there. Now, on the other side, okay, uh, we have uh, David suffers a, as a righteous sufferer uh, from Uh, from someone who is close to him, all right? And this is Absalom. (laughs) I think I spelled that right, copied it off the sheet. Nope, didn't, didn't. All right, so Absalom, okay? Um, I, I, I know you, you've worked through the Bible uh, before in terms of uh, seeing uh, David's sin with Bathsheba and uh, uh, how he, he got a curse from the Lord and that there would be enmity that, that runs through his family and that there would always be that strife. Um, however, uh, remember, remember the way that David treated Saul? Right? The way that David treated Saul was he was the Lord's anointed. He would never rise up. He, he had a completely righteous attitude in the way that David treated Saul. Well, Absalom does not treat David in that same way. Okay, Rather, Absalom stirs up jealousy in his own heart and begins to attack and usurp that throne. Okay, He actually rides into Jerusalem with an army and runs David out of town. Now, as you work through the Psalms, uh, you are given specific headings, specifically in Psalm chapter 3, where it details how Absalom has come in. And you're going to see in a moment that that we're going to pick up that language that both of these types run uh, run through strong there. But Absalom is not the only spot where we see this righteous supper who's someone close, close as a brother or a friend here, a son that rises up where, where the enemy is close and it is, it is a surprise, a shock that you would be betrayed by those that close to you. Yeah, but, but that's not the only one we see if we think of, of our Old Testament and we, we Pastor Jason mentioned one a moment ago, we started right in Genesis chapter four with Abel, right? Killed by his own brother. Abel offers the right sacrifice, a sacrifice that's pleasing to the Lord and is killed by his brother Cain because of his jealousy and anger toward his brother Abel. So we see that. We see moving on from him, we would see Isaac, right? And and even and his mother, Sarah, right? Isaac is, is somewhat oppressed, we would see, by, by his half-brother, his older half-brother, Ishmael. So we would see that. We would say in Jacob, we would see his older brother, Esau, right? Uh, after Jacob, the trickster, right, uh, takes the birthright, he has to flee from, from Esau, right? Even though God has said to, to their mother, Rebecca, right, that the older will serve the younger, right? I've given you that scripture there to look at. So there's another one as we trace that through. Um, and then we get to, to Joseph, Right, and we're going to spend a little bit of time on him in a minute, but, but Joseph, right, betrayed, oppressed, suffers under the hands of his older brothers. And then ultimately, we even see it in Moses. We spent a lot of time on Moses over these weeks. Uh, when you get to uh, Numbers chapter 12, we see that Moses' older siblings, both his, his brother Aaron and his sister Miriam, both rise up uh, and grumble against, against Moses. So we, we, we can see the same, the same type, the same pattern of suffering happening to, to those from people close to them, not just from an evil power outside of them, but from, from an unexpected place. But let's, let's just spend a couple of minutes looking at Joseph because what we see in all the accounts in Genesis, we almost see them all coming together, all these different types. We really see them coming together in the life of Joseph. And so I've kind of given you um, some, some storylines, right, with some words here to think through Joseph's life. 
First of all, we would say Joseph starts out when he comes on the scene in Genesis chapter 37, he starts out as exalted, right? We see him being the favorite son of his father, Jacob, right? His, the coat of, of many colors that, that Jacob was to give him, right? And so he has this, this position this, it, with, with, with his father, this, this place of honor and, and love. But then we see him being mocked by his brothers. And we're going to look at a verse there in, in Genesis chapter 37, verse 20 here in just a few minutes. But, but his brothers actually mock him, right? And they ridicule him. They're so jealous. It says they can't even stand to be around him because they're so jealous of his position with the father. And, and real, real quickly here, when, when you talk about Joseph being exalted, I know you've probably heard sermons on Joseph and, and the pastor says, hey, Joseph was a brat. Okay, and he walked around and he flaunted it and all that. A lot of that, like, it's not in the text. Okay, when you actually understand that Joseph is a type of Christ and you read through the text, Joseph hasn't done anything rather than be set aside as the favored one and one who gets dreams and promises from God himself. Okay, there, there, it, it's pretty important to understand Joseph is righteous. In, in his account and behavior. He, he's not pictured as he walked around doing anything that he wasn't supposed to do. It's simply because he is favored that now his brothers hate him. So. Right, exactly. And, and as a result of that, that hatred that, that, uh, uh, the, that his brothers have for him, Joseph is, is humbled. Think about what happens. He, he's humbled. How do we see that, that humbling, right? As he comes to check on his brothers being obedient to his father's instructions, they see him coming and they devise a plan, right? It's like, hey, let's kill him, right? And then let's, and then let's go back to our father and say, oh, he was killed by a wild beast, but let's, let's kill him, right? One of his brothers steps in at the last minute and says, no, maybe we shouldn't go that far. Let's sell him. Let's sell him as a slave to, to a caravan, but let's kill an animal and cover his coat in blood and we'll throw Joseph in a pit. We'll leave him for dead, as good as dead, but we'll throw him in a pit, right? And we'll wait for someone to come that we can sell him to, right? So he's stripped of his clothes. He's thrown in a pit, right? He is then presented to Jacob as being dead, right? He is then taken to Egypt where he is sold to Potiphar, right? He ends up working for Potiphar, right? He is, while there, he is tempted by Potiphar's wife, but he's righteous in that temptation. He resists the temptation, but then he's falsely accused by Potiphar's wife, right? And he then suffers again. He's put back in prison out of no fault of his own, right? He has been innocent. He has been righteous. He has done what would please God, but he is still suffering, but then we see him resurrected or exalted out of prison, and he is given the position of second in command of all of Egypt by the Pharaoh. And as a result of that position that, that God places him in, Joseph is able then to bring salvation to his people, right? That's just a quick highlight of the story of Joseph. But there should have been some language there that made some, some light bulbs go off for you. Let's think about that for a minute, right? In Philippians chapter two and verse eight, we can start right there where it says that Jesus being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross, right? The verse before that says he emptied himself, right? He, he, he left the glories of heaven and he emptied himself and he came, right? So Jesus, the son of God starts out in this exalted position, but he humbles himself. And in his humility, he subjects himself to mockery, right? To, to ridicule, to humility as he lives on earth, right? Living as one without even a home, right? Doesn't even have like a pillow to lay his head on, right? The son of man, he said that about himself. So he's, he's humble, right? He suffers at the hands of his own family. His brothers didn't understand him, right? They rejected him until after the resurrection. So he suffers just like Joseph. When we get to his Passion Week, we see Jesus being stripped of his clothes, being mocked once again by being made to wear a crown of thorns and a purple robe that is put on him. 
right? But we also see him thrown into a pit when he goes to Potiphar's house, awaiting this, this mockery, this sham of a trial. Jesus spends the night in a pit awaiting this trial that is going to be done. We see in his life that he faced temptation, right? We, we see him tempted in the wilderness for 40 days, yet without sin. We see him falsely accused by 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 the Sadducees and by the Pharisees, right, in order to condemn him to death. And then we see him give his life, shed his blood, die the death of a criminal on a cross that he did not deserve, right? He is dead. He is taken down from the cross. He is placed in a tomb for three days. But then we see him resurrected, amen? We see the Son of God come out of the tomb and resurrection, resurrected. And Scripture tells us that what we see, this suffering of Jesus, right, that we, can, that we can see that mirrors so much of what we read in Joseph, but the Son of God suffering for us, right? His, his exaltation to humiliation to then his suffering to then God raising him from the dead, right? It is that work of salvation that has brought redemption for you and I, right? Our hope of salvation comes from the fact that Jesus suffered for us, but then rose from the grave. So this incredible picture of Christ is seen through the life of Joseph. And what what makes it so exciting, Daniel, right, as you go back and and read the book of of Genesis and the account of Joseph, is you understand that the very evil deed that the brothers did is actually what produces the salvation on the other side, right? That is what sent Joseph to Egypt. That is what brought him about coming as the second in command and preserved them from the famine, right? What you meant for evil, God meant it for good. Their very evil deed is what God uses to actually redeem them on the other side. Is that not ridiculous? And yet that is salvation itself, right? That's what you see worked out in the book of Acts, right? What you meant for evil was according to the plan of God. And I love, in, I meant to cover in chapter 37, verse 20, when the brothers see Jesus, Joseph coming, they say, here he comes, let's kill him. And they say, and then let us see what becomes of his dreams. Right, when we think of the plan of God, right? Not the dream of God, but the purpose of God. The plan of God, since before scripture tells us, before the foundation of the universe, God's plan to send his son, right? The enemy, right? The devil, right? This this seed of the serpent, right? As we think back to our Genesis chapter three, verse, verse 15, right? The devil intended to thwart and to try to stop the plan of God, but he could not, right? Just as we think back and we read this story of Joseph and we think about the brothers having to eat those words, right? Let's see what becomes of his dreams, right? If we go all the way to to the end of Genesis, we see, well, yeah, here's what became of his dreams. They were fulfilled, right? And they were fulfilled, and it's because they were fulfilled that you are actually still able to be alive. Well, it it makes you think of, uh, of when Jesus is being crucified, right? Okay, you say you're the Messiah? Well, let's see. Come down. Right? All right, why don't you come down? You say you're the Messiah. I'm going to put you to death. Let's see what comes of your statement now. But there's resurrection on the other side. You have the death scene, you have resurrection on the other side. All of it in a pattern and typology that has been preserved, right? A thousand years ahead of time. Yes, sir. <laughs> they follow the same script, right? We gotta have we gotta have a plot. We've gotta have it right. It, it completely works through. Okay, we've got to move at light speed. All right, so so that we can cover all of this. But 
I mean, th- think of the, the 13 plus chapters that are given to the life of Joseph and the detail here and how important Joseph's story is, okay? Now, it, in the same sense, I told you Absalom uh, is, is the betrayer of David. That's the shocking Joseph's brothers here. Now, because of David's suffering, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to quickly walk through and show you that These patterns of him being a righteous sufferer, and as he writes in the book of Psalms, okay, begin to predict and show for you what is coming with Jesus. And this is actually the way that the New Testament, uh, there'll be a number of times I've highlighted stuff, but then I'd give you a scripture reference off to the side. Okay, and some of those scripture references are when the New Testament is quoting these. It's how you're to understand that David may be writing in the first person, but the New Testament sees them as a pattern that is picked up and pointing to Jesus. Okay, all right, so with that, book one of Psalms. Do you know there's books to Psalms? All right, there's five. Uh, The first book is from Psalm 3 to Psalm uh, 41, okay? And the primary theme of book one of Psalms, it hits the heaviest on David as a righteous sufferer, okay? And and what he is in, okay? So I want to show you some of the language. First of all, it starts out with Psalm 3. So that's the very first Psalm. And the very last psalm, we're going to go from the first to the last real quickly here. It starts out, and David is at being, he's fleeing from Absalom. He's being attacked by his son, okay? And he makes this statement, right? Verse 1, many are rising up against me, okay? And, and you will hear, I want you to see, there, there's going to be common language. He's going to say that he's in a pit. He's going to say that he's surrounded by his enemies. He's going to say he's in the depth of the water, and he's asking for God to pull him out. These are all the imagery that gets repeated over and over and over again. Now, smack dab in the middle of book one of Psalm uh, of Psalms, in this book one, I've given you this liturgical structure here, okay? This structure from Psalm 15 to Psalm 24. When you go back home, you're going to study this, and you'll be able to piece this together real quick. What I want to show you, this chiastic structure is the way that like, what you need to know here for just a second is that like Psalm 18 and Psalm uh, 20 and 21 go together. Psalm 17 and Psalm 22 go together. There's tons of parallels that are there, okay? So so here's the real quick movement. We're, we're gonna start on this next page. We're gonna start with a royal psalm. In the royal psalm, David is king, okay? But he is he's surrounded by his enemies, but he repeatedly talks about how victorious, he will be victorious over his enemies because God is with him, okay? So God drew me out of many waters. He delivered me from my strong enemies and from those who hated me, okay? He placed me as head of the nations. The people uh, who have not known me will serve me. All right, as we've gone through the threads, you realize as king, right, we're going to see that Davidic king rise up and be victorious. Okay, so even though the righteous is suffering, okay, in these two Psalms, you hear a lot of God's going to give me the victory, okay, and even some of the promises that we've come to expect. Now, also in this chiastic structure, what's interesting here. Psalm 17 and Psalm 22 is the death of the king. He is surrounded by his enemies, but what you see, so look at Psalm 17. My deadly enemies who surround me, okay? They are like a lion that is eager to tear, okay? And and David is crying out to deliver my soul. But at the end in verse 15, okay, You say, as for me, I shall behold your face in righteousness. I will be satisfied you with your likeness when I awake. There's actually a death scene. Catch it in Psalm 22 as well. Psalm 22 is is one of those that you marvel at because Psalm 22, written by David, before crucifixion was ever invented. But as you 
comb through Psalm 22, look how it starts. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That's what Jesus quotes from the cross. And then as you continue to work through the psalm, right, you hear all of this same language. Look at verse 8. Commit yourself to the Lord. Let him deliver him. Let him rescue him because he delights in him. My goodness, that's exactly what they said to Jesus while he was on the cross. Okay? Again, they, they, he is surrounded by a, a lion that wants to devour. But now listen to this. Verse 14. I am poured out like water. All my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. It is melted within me. My strength is dried up like a potsherd. My tongue cleaves to my jaws, and you lay me in the dust of death. For dogs have surrounded me. A band of evildoers has encompassed me. They pierced my hands and my feet, and I can count all my bones. They look and they stare at me. They divide my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. You don't need me to preach that, do you? <laughs> right? This is written by King David before crucifixion was ever invented. Okay? And all the and this is how the psalm ends. And all who uh, all the ends of the, the earth will remember. But look, there is a death scene at the end. Okay. Okay. So all the ends of the, the earth will know, and they will worship even he who cannot keep his soul alive. But in that chiastic structure, both in Psalm 16 and in Psalm 23, there is resurrection promise. You, you go back and you look at that chiastic structure. You, you, have, you have the exalted king, you have the king who dies, and then you have the king who is resurrected. Why is this so important? Look at Psalm 1610. For you will not abandon my soul to Sheol, nor will you allow your holy one to undergo decay. Now, that scripture passage is used repeatedly in the New Testament, and the New Testament authors say, see, David was talking about Jesus. David knew, and it was predicted, of the resurrection of the Messiah. I've showed you the chiastic structure. You're gonna, I'm moving fast, but you can go look at that. Look at how it's predicted, and then it's fulfilled. And you see the same thing in Psalm 23, because in Psalm 22, it said, he who was not able to keep his soul alive. Then in Psalm 23, verse 3, it says, he restores my soul. From what? From death, because you just died the chapter before, the last verse. Death and resurrection, okay? Now, then you can look at the end of book one, uh, uh, Psalm 40 and 41. You hear a lot of the same language. You're going to go through this and comb through it at home. You hear a lot of this, I was put in the pit. Remember the, this Joseph, right? He's in a pit, and then he gets brought out, okay? Okay, but, but it was said of me, behold, uh, sorry, let me look at verse 40. So this is picked up by the author of Hebrews. Look at 40, verse 6. It says, sacrifice and a meal offering you have not desired. Hebrews in, in chapter 10 says, but a body you have prepared. Where's he taking that from? He's taking it from right here. Because it says, sacrifice and meal offering you have not desired. Because then I said, then, uh, then I said behold, I come. In the scroll of the book, it is written of me. I delight to do your will, O God. So in the midst of David talking about being in the pit and surrounded by his enemies, suddenly you hear these promises that are picked up in the New Testament, like sacrifice and an offering you have not desired, but instead I have come to do your will. And the author of Hebrews says, in a body you have given me. Okay, But it's in the context of David being the righteous sufferer, and he's surrounded by his enemies. And then these promises keep unfolding, and there's more and more of them. Look at uh, Psalm 41. Even my close friend in whom I trusted, who ate my bread, has lifted up his heel against me. What's that talking about? Well, yeah, it's talking about Judas, right? You know that, but it's in the context in Psalm 41 when David is surrounded by his enemies. And this is where you see these promises, these details that apply to Jesus that, that the New Testament authors pick up on because they're understanding that when David as the righteous supper is in these circumstances and he's writing these psalms and then they see all these details and their minds are blown, they said, oh my goodness, God, 
a thousand years ago predicted and wrote all this stuff down and we saw it because Judas ate right with him. Right, look at it, it's right there. Okay? Now we can continue on. Psalm 69. Okay? Another, I, I, I put verse one in there so you would understand. It's the same language. Save me, O God, for the waters have threatened my life. He's being surrounded again. Verse nine, for, for zeal for your house has consumed me. And the reproaches of those who reproach you have fallen upon me. Oh my gosh. That's exactly what's said in John 2, 17 and Romans 15, 3. Okay? Look at verse 21. Same section, right? God, uh, David is surrounded, right? He's in a pit. Look at the pit and the flood. Those languages are always, it's about being surrounded by his enemies. And look at verse 21. And they gave me gall for my food. And for my thirst, they gave me vinegar to drink. Then look below. May there can't be desolate, and may none dwell in their tents. And in the book of Acts, chapter, chapter 1, verse 20, they pick up on that, and they say that this was talking about Judas, so, so he's, he's going to be desolate. And I hope you picked up on the, they gave me vinegar to drink as Jesus from the cross. Okay? Keep going, Psalm uh, 86, you can read that at home, Psalm uh, 88. Again, more, more language about being in the pit. It, Psalm 88 ends with the question, will you perform wonders for the dead? Will the departed spirits raise and praise you? Then, then uh, I don't have time to go into the structure of what's happening in all, in all of the Psalms. Psalms are a very complicated book, but I've, I've showed you. That's why I gave you that chiastic structure for that one section. Let me just tell you, Psalm 109 is right before Psalm 110. Psalm 110 is the giant exaltation of the Lord said to my Lord, you shall be a king according to the order of Melchizedek. It's the great presentation. I walked you guys through this before that Psalm 110 is the answer to Psalm 89. Psalm 89 says, where is the King David? And Psalm 110 is that answer. But guess what? Look at Psalm 109, right before the great exaltation of, uh, of King David, or, or of the Messianic king. Look at this, again, David is surrounded by his enemies, those who hate him. And then verse eight, let another take his office. That's directly quoted in, in Acts 120 when they, when they replaced Judas's office, okay? But then look, look at what it says, uh, verse 24. My knees are weak from, pass, from fasting. My flesh has grown lean without fatness. I have become a reproach to them. When they see me, they wag their heads. Again, quoted from the cross, your New Testament authors pick up that very language. That's right before the great exaltation of Psalm 110. Real quick, let's go uh, Psalm 118, okay? Again, look at the language. They have surrounded me. They've surrounded me, right? You're picking up on this by now, right? It's everywhere. It's, it's these things, right? They've surrounded, they've surrounded. But then look at some of the things that come out. Look, as, as we pick up verse 17, I will not die, but I will live the Lord has disciplined me severely, but, but he has not given me over to death. Look at this. The stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. Does that get picked up anywhere in the New Testament? How about a whole bunch of times? This is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. And then look at verse 26. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. We have blessed you from the house of the Lord. That gets picked up on Jesus' triumphal entry. So I've given you all these cross references here, but what you need to see is I've combed through these righteous sufferer. David is surrounded by his enemies, and as he's lamenting what's going on, suddenly in the midst of all those psalms, are you not overwhelmed that in the midst of that, he pops out details, okay, that we have no clue when exactly or how it happened in David's life. We just know it's written a thousand years before Christ. He pops out details. My enemy is eating my bread. My close friend is eating my bread. Or I can count on my bones. They've pierced my hand. And all of these details are unfolding in your Bible through this pattern of the righteous supper as you walk through the book of Psalms. And the book of Psalms is so prophetic in this pattern. 
This is what's taking place. And the New Testament, the New Testament authors quote the book of Psalms more than any other spot. They just point to it over and over and over again because they're understanding what's happening in this typology. And then they picked up on it with what happened with Jesus. And they're like, my goodness, look at this, this, and this, and this, and this. Right? So you have all that. It's all prepared right there. You take that home and, and, and now you're like, Look at the way that this is fulfilled a thousand years before Christ. Now, once you get to the other side of Psalms, okay, Isaiah 53. Now, we've walked through Isaiah some because the main theme in the book of Isaiah is the new exodus, okay? We had a whole section on the new exodus. What I want you to see is some of these patterns, they converge, okay? And that is... Uh, Isaiah 52 comes right before Isaiah 53, okay? Most of us are pretty familiar with Isaiah 53, but I want to put it in the context for you because the context is the new exodus is coming. That's what you see in Isaiah 52. The new exodus is coming. The new, and so I've highlighted the new exodus language. We had a whole time on that, okay? And then... The servant is introduced. And as the servant is introduced, look at the way the servant is introduced because there are surprising characteristics, okay? Because his appearance, look at verse 14, was marred more than any other man. And then you immediately move into Isaiah 53. Isaiah 53, verse 2. Uh, Isaiah pulls previous promises out of Isaiah 11 about the David, right, from the shoot of Jesse, the branch of Jesse, and he rewrites that, for he grew up before us like a tender shoot and a root out of parched ground. And then you begin to walk through and you see the righteous suffer in the most clear passage in the entire Old Testament about the coming Son of God, the servant, the set-apart The the new Exodus leader who's going to be a righteous sufferer, and you see the clearest example of substitutionary atonement in the entire Bible. As clear as day. But I've given you how to understand the context of what's going on, right? But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Verse four, surely our griefs he himself bore. Verse five, the chastising of our well-being fell upon him and by his scourging, we are healed. Again, all of that pointing to the cross of Christ, piercing, scourging. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. I've done a whole section on the, the silent lamb of God. You can see the scripture references like a lamb that is led to slaughter, like a sheep before its shoes. So he did not open his mouth. His grave was assigned with wicked men, and yet he was with a rich man in his death. Oh, by the way, Joseph of Arimathea, a rich man, gave him his tomb. His grave was assigned with wicked men. By the way, he was crucified next to two criminals. But the Lord was pleased to crush him, putting him to grief, if he would render himself as a guilt offering. Okay. Amen? Okay. Seeing the way the Old Testament begins to put these themes together, begins to show you. All right. I've one, one more. Yeah, add to before, it. Before you go. Okay. Um, just to give you a chance to catch your breath, too. So. <laughs> Verse 11 of, of 53, where it says, By his knowledge, the righteous one, my servant, will justify the many, and he will bear their iniquities. Do you remember as we trace through some of these Old Testament figures that were that were described to be to be righteous in their day, right? We would say that about Joseph, we saw that about Job, right? We would have said that about Abel, we would we'll have even said it about Noah. And right here, he picks up on that, right? Not just someone who was righteous, relatively speaking, to those around him, but the one who is completely righteous. Because what we know is there is no salvation for us, right? Jesus has to be the perfect, righteous sufferer if he is going to be the substitute for our sin. If his suffering, if it is going to take the place 
of us having to suffer eternally, eternal punishment at the hand of a holy God because of our sin. He must be righteous, right? We're looking at the suffering, you know, so much, seeing all these ways that the Psalms points us to that. But don't miss how it's qualified here by saying he is the righteous sufferer. Amen. Okay, I gave you a homework assignment because I want to I, I, I want to unfold for you very rapidly. I've got a little time left. My favorite typology in the whole of the Bible, mainly uh, most people know of Joseph as a typology. You've kind of heard it, have it unfolded a time or two before, but very few know of the Daniel six typology. Okay, and so. You have it on your sheet there in front of you. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to call your attention to it. But what I love about this, Daniel 6 is Daniel in the lion's den, okay? And you know what we mainly do with Daniel chapter 6? We, te- we, we teach it to our uh, four-year-olds, and we give them a coloring page, and we go, hey, color this, and uh, that's, that's what we know about the story of Daniel and the lion's den. Maybe we act it out and we crawl around on all fours, Okay? All right, but ready? Daniel 6, Daniel in the lion's den is the most explicit, most magnificent typology of the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ that you've ever seen in the Old Testament. And it's been right in front of your eyes and you've never seen it before. And when we unfold it, you are going to be blown away because it is magnificent. Ready? All right, here we go. Daniel 6, 1. Or it seemed good for Darius to appoint uh, satraps. So Darius is, a, is appointing a whole bunch of leaders over the kingdom, all right? And then he appoints three of them who are going to be commissioners above those satraps. And Daniel's one of those. Look at verse 3. Then Daniel began distinguishing himself among the commissioners and satraps. Why? Because he possessed an extraordinary spirit. By the way, that's really unusual language for the Old Testament, Okay. Daniel has an extraordinary spirit, begins to distinguish himself, and the king planned to appoint him over the entire kingdom, okay? Like Joseph, remember Pharaoh wanted to appoint Joseph over the entire kingdom, all right? Like, I want to give the kingdom to you. There's a foreign king power wants to give. There's a Hebrew who's rising up as the hero, and the king wants to give the entire kingdom to Daniel. Why? Because he possessed an extraordinary spirit of God, okay? So the king took special notice of him, wants to appoint the entire kingdom to him. By the way, Jesus possessed the spirit of God in an extraordinary fashion. Why? Because he was and is the son of God. And God the Father loves the Son and desires to appoint Jesus over the entire kingdom. Okay? This is shown, it's shown throughout the New Testament. I've given you two examples in Philippians 2. At the name of Jesus, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Everyone will. You must bow before King Jesus. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 also talks about this is how the end is going to happen. Jesus has abolished death. God the Father says to the Son, sit at my right hand until I make all your enemies a footstool. I am going to work and defeat all of your enemies, place them at your feet. Everyone must bow before you, King Jesus. And then Jesus will turn everything back over to the Father and then eternity begins. Okay? So, In this typology, the king wants to give the entire kingdom to he who is the hero, all right? The righteous hero. All right, verse four. But the commissioners and satraps begin to try to find a ground of accusation against Daniel, okay? But they could find no ground of accusation, right? There's no evidence of of, uh, corruption in as much as he is faithful There's no negligence or corruption, nothing to be found in him, okay? So the leaders become jealous of Daniel. They're they're looking for uh, ways, but but they cannot find it. Daniel is righteous, okay? We've seen that, right? Joseph is portrayed as as righteous as these stories unfold. (coughs) You're told, well, well, he was righteous, and he was righteous, and 
David was righteous and all of these things. And here, Daniel is also righteous. Now, we already know where this is going because Daniel unfolded it, right? That is, this righteousness that is, that is portrayed in relative sense is pointing towards the absolute righteousness of the one who is coming. And so Jesus in Jerusalem, surrounded by those who were jealous of his authority and the attention of, of, of they were also jealous of his extraordinary spirit, right? The relationship that, that he had with God, the Holy Spirit that was upon him, whether they would say that or not, okay? And they seek to bring false charges against him, but they could find none. He is found blameless, so what do they do? They say, well, well, since we can't find any accusations against him, we will find an accusation, look at verse five, with regard to the law of his God. So the leaders know that Daniel's completely faithful, right, to his God, the one true God, so they intend to capture him in his faithfulness. By the way, Jesus' final charge was that he was the anointed son of God. That was his charge. So what do they do in Daniel chapter 6? They create a petition, okay? They go to king and, and they say, king, uh, let's create a petition. No one can pray to anyone besides you, okay? Or they are put to death. You are the king. You are the authority. No one can rise up except to you, all right? So the trap. Okay, they're, they're like, look, there's only one king and anyone else making such claims must be put to death. Similarly, the Jewish leaders took Jesus to Pilate with the charges. Hey, Jesus claims to be king of the Jews. However, we have no king but Caesar. And anyone claiming to be king must be put to death for treason. Okay, so uh, back to Daniel 6. Once they know that the document has been signed, once it's, uh, uh, once it's set in place, um, that no one can pray to any other king besides Darius, you know how they trap Daniel? In his faithful, regular prayer spot. They knew that he always prayed three times a day towards Jerusalem. Why? Because he is faithful. That's what it says there. He is faithful to give petitions and supplication to his God. Similarly, Jesus was captured in the night because Judas knew where his regular spot of prayer was. And it was there that Jesus had gone to make faithful petition before God in the Garden of Gethsemane. Now, they come back and they tell Darius, we've got Daniel. Is Darius happy about it? He's not. Look at it. It says, soon as the king heard this statement, he was deeply depressed and he set his mind to delivering Daniel. Right? He's going to do everything he can to rescue him. But these men came and said, look, right? You signed the law. It must be held. Recognize it is the law of the Medes and the Persians that no injunction or statute, right, may be changed. Similarly, the Jews bring Jesus to Pilate. Pilate is deeply distressed, wishes to release Jesus. But the crowd and the Jewish leaders, right, they continue to threaten mob violence. He must be put to death for the charge of claiming he's king. He must be killed. Now, through this typology, you may have noticed that the king in the beginning was God. But we've seen as you walk through it, the wrestling, we've seen some parallels with Pilate. And so in thinking and meditating through this typology, I also want you to recognize that God the Father had no pleasure in putting his son to death. But the law and his holiness demands it. It must be done. There is no other way. So, what does the king do? He gives orders for Daniel to be cast in the pit. Okay, the pit. We've seen that as a uh, language used. He, he must be cast in 
the den of lions, where death occurs. That's what happens in lion's dens, death. But as Darius does so, listen to what he says. Darius is actually hopeful for resurrection on the other side of this death scene, or that God will save out of the mouth. Your God, whom you constantly serve, will deliver you. Now, in case you think I'm stretching things too far, look at verse 17. And a stone was brought and laid over the mouth of the den, and the king sealed it with his own signet ring and with the signet rings of the nobles. Do you need me to preach that for you? This was written 500 years before Christ. So you got the scene. Daniel is in the lion's den, and a stone is rolled over and sealed by the king and all the other nobles. Well, the stone was rolled in front of the tomb of my Lord because people were worried. This, this trickster said he would rise from the dead. So you place a stone and you place guards and you seal it. You see the scripture references there. Then the king went off to his palace and spent the night fasting. No entertainment was brought before him and sleep fed him, fled from him, sorry. Then the king arose at dawn at the break of day and went in haste to the lion's den. Come on. The women got up early on Sunday morning and didn't even know why they were going to the tomb. I mean, they thought they were going to prepare his body. You got details woven in 500 years later and the women are getting up. They think they're going to the tomb to anoint his body and to put oil. We didn't even get to put oils on his body. They should have been like King Darius. They should have been getting up at the break of dawn, running to the tomb as your God saved you and risen you from the dead. They didn't know. There was no expectation. But they showed up early in the morning at the break of dawn. That's what Luke 24, 1 says. And he calls out to Daniel, right? Daniel, are you alive? Has your God saved you? And Daniel's like, yes. Okay. Uh, my God sent his angel and he shut the lion's mouth and they have not harmed me inasmuch as I was found innocent before him. And towards you, O king, I have committed no crime. Why was Daniel saved? Because he was the righteous one. Right? I've committed no crime. God has found me innocent. I am righteous. Okay? And he comes out and there's no injury found on him because he trusted in God. And Jesus came out of the grave on the other side because he is the one and the only forever that is completely righteous. The only one who seeks God, the only one who can stand before God, right? That's why he rose from the dead. That's why he's on the other side. That's why he's my substitute. That's why he's my king and your king. He's the only one righteous. And he came out on the other side of the grave. Guys, this is a children's story. Go color your page. Look how cute that is, right? Daniel's thrown in the pit of, uh, of, of death. Darius believes he will get resurrected on the other side. He believes God will save him, seals it with a tomb, comes at the break of dawn. And as Daniel is taken out, listen to the way that this ends. Listen to the way that this ends. Then Darius the king wrote, to all the peoples and nations and men from every language who live in the land. What does that sound like to you? That sounds like the Great Commission to me. That sounds like a thread of dominion that we've traced already in here that every tribe, language, and tongue, everyone must know. Okay, so that's what, how, how Darius starts. That all the people's nations and men from every language who are living in the, end, oh, in the land, I make a decree that all dominion of my kingdom 
of men are to fear and tremble before the God of Daniel, for he is the living God and endures forever, and his kingdom is one which will not be destroyed, and his dominion will be forever, for he delivers and rescues and performs signs and wonders in heaven and on earth, who has also delivered Daniel from the power of the lions." And all you would have to do to replace that in the New Testament is, and he delivers from the power of death, which is what the lions are, right? This is what the whole picture is in this whole pattern, this whole typology. And so this whole section ends with what sounds like the Great Commission. Everyone, everywhere, shall know, this must be known to the ends of the earth, that our God is a God who saves from the pit of death death because there's a righteous one who went down into the pit of death and came out on the other side and he was vindicated as the only righteous one ever to live and so all must know and all must bow down before king jesus because he is the only one the only name given under heaven by which men must be saved written 500 years before christ in a pattern that you should have picked up on, picks up on many of these exact same themes. Exact same themes that point to Jesus. The king wants to give all of his authority to this number two who is the Hebrew hero rising up as the righteous one who also suffers mightily, but he always overcomes. He always overcomes. Woven in story after story, none of them trite. That's what's magnificent of it. Every one of them's real and unique and has complexity to it, but once you begin to see it, and once you have the true one on the other side, you cannot help but look and be absolutely blown away at the magnificence of it, because it's all pointing to him. Is your God not creative? Is your God not magnificent? Has your God not been trying to set into motion from eternity past and tell the story of his coming son so that when he showed up and you look back and you say, you say, how could I ever miss it? My goodness, you have been writing and weaving and putting in details like at the break of dawn he came to the tomb and it was sealed and there was a rock over it. Or with Joseph, the, the very evil act is what saves them on the other side. You can't, like God wrote all this stuff. He prepared it and, it, and, it's, and it's, you can go through Esther, Esther and Mordecai. I, I didn't even have time. I, I, I wrote you a little note. I said, I didn't even have time to do this with Esther and Mordecai. But let me just tell you, it's another pattern. And I gave you the ending of chapter 10 and there's Mordecai, right? And the same thing happens with Mordecai. And the king gave everything to the number two who rose up. Same sort of stuff. Jason, something as we've been going through this tonight that really sticks out as we see all these examples of people before Christ, right? Who the details of, like you just pointed out, their real life, right? Real events in their real life, right? David writing the Psalms about real experiences in his life. Daniel's story here, Joseph's story, all these, Job's story, right? All of these, we see them, right? And they point us to Jesus, to this purpose of God in the gospel, Right, and it is, and it blows our mind. It's, it's magnificent to think that, that, that God is sovereign and that we can trust him, right? That's the thing that it screams to me as I listen. It's like, if God can take the lives of, of people, right, and these details of their lives and the circumstances they went through, right, and every one of them can point us to his ultimate overarching purpose, right, to redeem and to restore fallen humanity to himself, What about our lives? Amen. Right? What, what, about, what about for you and I? Do the details of our lives matter? Amen. Do the details of our lives point back to the cross? Right? All these are pointing forward to the cross. 
But you and I get an opportunity on this side of the cross and on this side of the resurrection, right, to live a life that also points people to that same point, right? Both sides of history point, point to what Jesus did on the cross, right? So as we live our lives to know the sufferings that we go through, right? The victories that we have, right? The day-to-day just routines that we, that we go through. Every one of those are an opportunity for people to look at our lives and say, that looks like Jesus, yeah. right? I think it's magnificent That's to look at yeah. it from, from that side. Absolutely. As well. So, so well put, right? These sufferings point to the cross, our sufferings, right? The New Testament is full of this idea, right? A living sacrifice that we have this treasure in jars of clay so that when we crack, the gospel can leak out, right? It all points to the cross. So well said. Great. What do you think? Was it worth all the hype that I gave it ahead of time? Look at that, and I get you out three minutes early. Any quick questions? All right, you got a lot of material, right? You can go home, you can study, you can go, man, I was drinking from a fire hose. Uh, but isn't it good? Isn't our God good? Let's pray to the end of, of what we just talked about. Daniel, why don't you pray for us? God, we thank you tonight uh, just for the incredible beauty of your word. God, the complexity that we see, but God, the simplicity that we yes. see, that it all points to Jesus. God, may we leave here after this study understanding in a way maybe that we've never understood before that you are the center of everything. Everything is about your glory. Everything is about exalting the name of Jesus. Every detail, every every fiber of our being is for that purpose because God, you are the only one who is worthy of that praise and of that worship. And God, so may our understanding of your word tonight God, just draw our hearts and our affections and our devotion to you, right? To live as a living sacrifice, as we have just said, right? That is holy, acceptable, and pleasing to you. God, may our lives be pictures of the work of the gospel as you continue to work out in us the beauty of a life that's been transformed. By, by the power of Jesus Christ and the indwelling spirit that you have put in us as your blood-bought children who have been redeemed by the righteous sufferer. We thank you tonight that we have that confidence and that assurance to live lives of surrender and devotion to you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen.